Is corruption an excuse for corporate South Africa to abandon a failing government? We speak to Mark Lubner, the chairman of notable corporate and humanitarian organizations. Welcome, Mark. Good morning. Thanks very much for having me on the show. Well, somebody who's been very vocal about the issue is Rob Hersoff, who has reserved a special place in hell uh, for appeasing business executives. Why do you think he might be wrong? Well, first and foremost, I don't think that I'm going to look forward to the journey to hell, as Rob possibly suggests. And I should probably preface my comments by saying I certainly like the man, but certainly am not in sync or supportive of a number of the comments, which I think are not just derogatory, I think that they're necessarily negative and damaging um, to the efforts of a number of people, uh, such as myself, who have dedicated a lifetime, basically, to try and see how we uplift this country. So my own personal sentiment is that there, there are a huge number of us committed to being here who have the option to leave, and certainly have the means in which to leave, but we choose to stay. And we choose to stay with a sense of purpose. Now, can you give us some examples of positive private civic and government engagements that you have been part of? Uh, yeah, I mean, the work that I do um, predominantly is in the field of child and youth development, addressing issues of unemployment and, and finding ways and systems to work um, despite the fact that government has significantly dropped the ball in a lot of these areas of social services. Simply paying social grants is not a solution in and of itself. The interesting thing to start with the framework is that I believe our government has got policies, starting with the constitution, which are extraordinary. They have been crafted um, in a conscious manner. However, we can certainly find fault with implementation. But that just simply means that the gap has been filled to a large extent by civil organizations, remarkably so, um, who soldier on irrespective uh, of the fact that we are a highly fragmented industry sector and, in, and the government in, in its implementation of policies is at times necessarily lacking, not at times, very often lacking. Um, but we also soldier on with the support of corporate South Africa. Corporate South Africa is spending billions. I think the last report that I saw from Crowdon was in the order of about 12 billion a year um, addressing social needs. Well, if we have a social population of, I don't know, call it 40% of the population, 30 to 40 million people who are requiring uh, opportunities, well, we've got enough money that's being invested, I think, by corporate South Africa alone, never mind government's grants. The problem that, and so you asked me for a positive. A positive would be working with, for I can say, the Department of Social Development here in Gauteng. Um, one example, and for 12, 13 years, I've sat in front of the panel each year reporting back on how we've utilized some of the grant funds that we've had, supplemented obviously by private sector funding as well. But the process has always been rigorous, honest, without corruption. And if anything, I, as a recipient of those funds, have recognized the responsibility that I've got to use those funds appropriately. And I don't just report from an accounting perspective, I have to necessarily report on impact. And they send out field officers to check that what I'm saying uh, in each one of our sites across the, uh, the Gauteng province, in this instance, uh, necessarily are delivering a line in a manner that I've uh, reported back on. That's a positive science um, of accountability. Um, my Smile Foundation works across the country, but in particular in the Western Cape. The Department of Health there and ourselves have uh, dovetailed and partnered now for the best part of over 20 years, where the Department of Health gives us access to surgeries, access to the surgeons, and our role is necessary to look at all the providing the consumables and all the other anxiety support services. It's been a remarkable public-private partnership. And each year, uh, between five and 600 odd young individuals, young kid children, uh, are able to receive surgery at very affordable rates. Um, I believe that that's another example that should be exemplified 
rather than necessarily vilified. Um, if you were to ask me, is the top layer of our leadership uh, lacking? Are they are they wanting? Um, have we got enough instances of corruption? Absolutely. But you've got to work with what is, and certainly you've got to bring about change. And we have a democracy, which means that we have a process through which change can necessarily happen. Um, if we've got poorly informed voters, my suggestion to Rob is, Rob, raise money to help educate those voters so that when they do go to the polls, they'll vote with knowledge and an understanding of how um, uh, the civil society sector necessarily should operate or how our politicians should necessarily behave. Um, but simply to uh, negate the work that a number of business leaders or civil society leaders are doing, is it's just not productive. How do you see private-public cooperation revitalizing the South African economy, something it so badly needs? Well, first of all, I think that there needs to be far more accountability. Supposedly, we have an independent judicial sector in this country, and certainly if I look at you know, a, a number of the judges and if I look at sort of the um, friends that I have in that society, um, I'm perplexed why more accountability, why there aren't more consequences for actions. Why do we still have people where there's a body of evidence um, not being prosecuted and, frankly speaking, jailed? Um, I think that society needs to uh, build its faith once again um, in the due processes of law. And that's the first issue. The second issue, I believe, is that um, there need to be a lot more true private public, public private partnerships. And I'm um, speaking to people like uh, uh, A.D. Enthoven and hearing about some of the initiatives that he's dr driving, the Afrodeman's driving, in a sync with the uh, office of the president. And I'm quite encouraged by those kinds of initiatives. I'm quite encouraged that these are not just um, chit-chat sessions, but they have uh, actual tangible outcomes that they're working towards and a due process that's being followed that will lead us, hopefully, to a situation where we're not necessarily dependent on Eskom uh, for even a day for our power supply, but there's moves towards privatization around power generation, for argument's sake. Um, so I do see a number of these uh, scenarios where you've got um, intellectual brain power coming from heads of organizations, the Adrian Gores, for argument's sake of the world, uh, starting to work uh, a lot more comprehensively with um, uh, government departments at the most senior level. Once again, it's going to come down to implementation. Um, my battle cry is... In these conversations, civil society leaders need to necessarily be brought in to the fray. We're the guys that are on the ground that are going to actually have to deliver to a large extent. So wonderful that plans are being made. My you know, plea is that those corporates and government officials uh, involve civil society because if there are skills to be retrained, you're converting power stations, coal power plants into renewables, well... There's a need to have individuals reskilled in those environments, and that job is going to fall on the hands of civil society. Let's not wait until the decisions are made. Let's do, the, do those sort of planning processes um, in one accord um, earlier enough on. The second element is to say, you know, I remember my late dad, uh, literally in his last few months of his life, he wanted to start an initiative where... Um, we speak the good news. We speak positively because his philosophy was good news develops more good news. Good thoughts create. It's all about energy. If you put out a real positive energy, my lessons in life are that I invariably attract that back again. Uh, and that's certainly been the mantra in our uh, little organization at Africa Tikkun that you know, grew over the last 10 years. Um, from a, a 20 to 30 million a year organization to now a 500 million a year organization. So, so it's by doing positive elements. If I adopted a mindset to say, 
oh, no, everybody's lousy, everybody's corrupt, what's the point? Then, frankly speaking, initiatives like that don't get off the ground. And please, that's why I'm not looking for kudos for myself or our organization, but rather the example. So to the naysayers, um, absolutely, we all know we've got problems. We know we've got a dire situation. We passed the 11th hour already. We've got young people, and I'm working with them um, on a daily basis in t townships across South Africa. They're, they've lost faith with the system. It's not a matter that they're losing faith. They have lost faith with the democratic system. Even those who understand the importance of their vote are of the opinion that until uh, there's a material change uh, and they start to see outcomes that are different to what they're experiencing today, that they've lost faith in this democratic process. We have one of two options. If we can either become a, a, a dictator state nation, for an extreme, uh, or we can simply just become a, a, you know, a basket environment where anybody and everybody just grabs whatever they possibly can uh, while the going is good. I do believe in the democratic processes. It's a philosophy that I've, frankly speaking, been raised with, believe in, albeit I recognize a number of its flaws and its faults, rich getting richer, poor getting poorer. So you've got to have a level of maturity that necessarily implements a democratic process that appoints leaders that genuinely are going to care about the poorest of the poor in much the same way they're going to care about the richest of the rich. We haven't experienced that, quite frankly, in the last, certainly since Madiba days. Um, but it's not out of reach. It's possible. My late grandfather had a great saying. He used to say, people get sick and die. A country gets sick, but it never dies. So if we realize that this time, this what I call a um, period of corruption, period of incompetence, will pass, then we have to ask ourselves, what do we want once it has passed? Because it will pass at some point of time, maybe nearly my lifetime, perhaps I'm hoping my lifetime. Um, I'm still hoping to still be around uh, long enough to see that. Um, but, but I honestly do believe that if you adopt a mindset that's more long-term thinking, then we start to react differently, start to plan differently, we start to hold people account to account differently. So, um, you know, and I have seen examples, as I say, where in certain local municipalities, um, local people pulling together to get the job of work done. Pleasant Blue Bay and Bitu municipality is a very interesting one. Um, they had a clean audit uh, this last year. Why? Because they had a great mayor. They had political parties who came together to effectively manage that uh, village growing now into a town, growing into a mini city. Um, and, you know, if you look at the statistics in that environment, you'll probably find that that's pro pro an, an unlimited, in my knowledge, quite frankly, um, about issues of employment, et cetera, et cetera. But generally speaking, it just seems to be a community that's working. So why is it that we can't necessarily take that model and adopt um, a, um, I almost want to call citizen-led engagement with um, civil society organizations, with the corporate sector, and, and then just use the policies of government to help enable what needs to get done. Um, my, my belief is if we take the initiative, go out there, just get it done, we're not reliant as an organization for argument's sake on the work that we do, which is a, a child and youth development creating a career program. And we've got about 10,000 kids every year that are going into various forms of employment. Well, we're not doing that reliant purely on government. Government is a supporter in the codes, the BE codes, which incentivize skills, training, and employment of uh, young black individuals. You know, help with that initiative. Um, so, so I'm not looking necessarily to government to actually bail out organizations like ourselves. I'm, I, I, I'm dependent on government and 
realistically to become an enabler uh, through their programs and policies. I'm anticipating a government that will give us access to facilities that government can provide with a government that realizes that they actually don't have the competencies and skills. I'm sorry if I'm out, I know I'm waxing lyrical, but there, one other example, there, there's one example that really does come to mind. We, we've developed, and I keep sounding like it's talking about us, 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 but, 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 but that's almost the example, I, I, if I may be given the liberty to use without necessarily sounding egotistical. So we, we developed a brand new approach to early childhood development Without worrying with the detail, it's very much more individual focused rather than classroom average focused. So children progress based on a workbook that they have to work through. And then we do the assessments, giving feedback per child, per class, per school. We took this to the minister. The minister of basic education arrived on a Saturday morning, driving herself. She came to our hotel um, and she uh, was supposed to be with us from 8 o'clock until 9, she was giving us an hour. Well, she left at 12. No bodyguards, no fancy drivers. Drove herself there. She said she listened. She brought a DG with her. And she saw the value, not only of the, um, at the, the curriculum, but of this whole feedback approach. Private sector could provide feedback to facilities that government would necessarily help to subsidize. Great working model. We entered into, took us a period of time, problems around implementation, obviously, that I was referring to. It probably took us about uh, six to eight months before we actually were able to sign off on an MOU. Now, government's not going to give us any money under that MOU, but they're going to look at the pilot that we've agreed, and if the impact as we anticipate will be there, then they're going to encourage, national government is encouraged, the regions, the provinces, the local government offices, to look at how each necessarily supports preschools in disadvantaged areas, in rural areas, to necessarily adopt this process. We're not looking to make money on it. So there's no greed motive. We measure our success by the number of children who pass certain benchmarks. And then ultimately we'll work hopefully towards some kind of social bond that uh, UNICEF or the department itself will provide against, against outcomes, against successful results, successful children integrating into the school system and having had the foundation blocks properly addressed. Those are the kinds of models that I believe potentially will get us out of the situation that we're in. To do that, you've got to think positively. You cannot just constantly, you know, berate certain individuals and keep beating them over the back with a whip. What does that accomplish other than just to create more and more negativity, which effectively does not less generate positive outcomes? Now, how do you see the future of public-private enterprise uh, under a possible coalition government? Yeah, I think it's an interesting situation. I think, you know, um, the... Uh, what's that saying? Necessity breeds innovation, something along those sorts of lines. Um, and we're at that point, you know, government slashing budgets all over the place. Well, we're either going to sit back and say, oh, no, 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 they shouldn't be doing that. And corruption has stole a whole bunch of money that should be used for these social purposes. Well, the corruption has happened. Let's leave it now to... Um, the um, you know the policing forces and the judicial forces to hold people to account and try and recover some of that money. I can't do anything about what's happened already, other than as I say, and we should hold people to account. And that's where Rob is absolutely his comments are absolutely appropriate. We should be prosecuting individuals who are guilty of having stolen from the nation. Going forward, I have got to turn around and understand. Fiscus is there. And Treasury just simply doesn't have the money to carry on funding social services in the manner which they've done necessarily in the past. So what's the alternative? Well, let's all you know, go home and cry ourselves to sleep. Or do we pull up our big boy Brooks, okay, our big girl panties, and say, okay, let's apply our minds and let's apply what funds we necessarily prepare to commit. Um, uh, that we can commit 
and maybe we won't get short-term cash returns. But my gosh, we'll be investing into a future where we can. Unless you don't believe in this country. And my view to people who don't truly believe in the country, don't believe that we have sufficient assets, and I'm talking about not just monetary assets, people assets, then to my view to those people is find a life elsewhere. Don't stay here and necessarily drag the rest of us down. So you wouldn't, unlike Herzog, tell the African National Congress and it, or any other ruling parties to footsack? No, I probably would. I would probably join uh, a bandstand with Rob saying to our current leadership, Futsak, you guys haven't delivered. The same way I would say to any of my top management in any of my uh, uh, civil society organizations or any of my businesses, if they're not delivering as anticipated, and so long as I've been clear right up front about what my expectations are and I've provided the means and the resources for them to deliver, I would say to them, Futsak, our government has had the means, it's had the resources, and it's had enough time now. And it hasn't delivered. So Futsak, it would be the, the statement I would make. Maybe I wouldn't put it in those particular terms, I think. But I would certainly say, step aside, align with ch or, and or change. And not that I believe certain individuals are capable of change, because I think that absolute power has corrupted absolutely. I feel that the greed motivation when it sinks in, you know, it's an interesting thing. When you're in service of others, when you're truly in service of others, the reward that you get back is indescribable. No amount of money can necessarily buy that. But when you lose that, and I do believe that there are a number of our lay leaders who when they're in service of black South African society and its advancement, got an enormous amount back, but then they felt trapped into the trap of um, falling in love with money. And you never have enough money, quite honestly. No sooner have you made your first million that you went to the next billion. No sooner have you made your billion, you start comparing yourself to somebody else. And, and it's a never-ending cycle. The rat gets on the mat, and it just keeps on pe uh, uh, peddling. Whereas when you truly give of service, which is really what our lay leadership, uh, what I'm sorry, our, our government leadership, should be doing, not just relying on lay leadership, then I'm afraid I kind of lost faith to a large extent in true service leadership, which is what I expect from our president down. So do I believe there's a future? Yes, I do. I think these coalitions uh, that we're likely to encounter are going to be complex and difficult. They're going to work in certain parts of the country and they're going to fail in others. Um, and we're going to have a lot of lessons to learn. My peer is that the private sector and the intellect that exists in private sector brings civil society, got the experience, gosh, uh, to help uh, you know guide some of these you know situations and scenarios. And most importantly, let's hold people to account. Let's have a system where we hold people to account. And when they're not delivering, get rid of them. And if they're stealing, put them in jail. Thank you. That was Mark Lubner speaking to Biz News. I am Christine.